Hi. Hi, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to ask you first to please talk us through a little bit about what the TCSN network and the middle school work group specifically does around the college bound scholarship signups. Yeah, thank you, April. Thanks for the kudos. Um, <laughs> I, along with many other people in this room that advocate for children and care so much about our students. Um, so Tacoma College Support Network, so I'm trying not to use acronyms, um, is one of the CANs or College Access Net or Community Access Networks, I don't know, CANs. <laughs> And, um, and we have been a long standing group for, I think over 15 years prior to graduate Tacoma. And one of our, um, one of the group's uh, goals has always been to help support the school district, Tacoma Public School District in signing up kids for the college bound scholarship in seventh and eighth grade. So counselors in this district take this very seriously. Our middle school counselors take this very seriously. And our middle school group is, uh, one of its goals is to form support for that. So those of us who work in middle schools, and there are several of us in the call that do that, um, as additional organizations to Tacoma Public Schools, how can we lean in and help all of our students get signed up for College Bound Scholarship? That is a, uh, helps a financial barrier for many of our students as they start college it brings down that financial barrier um, significantly because we have some really good uh, financial aid that our legislators have advocated for, for students of first generation, low income students of color. Um, and our district has a significant percentage in many of our schools that get to sign up for that if we can convince them that this is important to sign up for them. So that has been one of the barriers is that we actually have to get their signature, student signature, and their parents' signatures. And for uh, parents who are working many hours and uh, don't necessarily come from a background where college has been in their lives, this getting this signature is always a significant barrier and always a huge lift for both the counselors, all the people in the schools that are working on this. Um, and in, in this COVID year, our middle school group said, is there a way that we can advocate that we don't have to get those signatures. How are we gonna do that in a remote environment? So we advocated um, in Gray uh, Sterling and uh, Yokiko with WASAC, Washington Student Achievement Council, uh, were our partners in advocating um, from not just the Tacoma Public School point of view, but statewide, is this something that we could see a change in? In the meantime, we advocated for ninth graders or past eighth graders to have uh, more time to sign up for it this fall, which we were given. That was a uh, given, uh, that wasn't a legislative advocacy ask, but it was an ask um, to change that. Um, and we were able to change that so that we were signing students up now in ninth grade, which required changes in systems because we were no longer working at the middle school level alone. Um, and we worked really hard together on that ninth grade. Now the governor has given us a month uh, where anybody in already in the portal, that means they're free and reduced lunch and they have been uploaded into the portal, uh, will have automatic into this scholarship. So that is one advocacy. And, and uh, we are hoping that this is a legislative fix in the future. Um, so we're still advocating with WASAC and with other partners that this, um, this be for all, all students throughout this school year for sure, and last of course, um, and then um, and maybe look at new ways to do this um, so that families still understand that they're getting the scholarship, but that there's not this barrier of a signature. Thanks, Lisa. Gray. No, so Gray Sterling not only uh, works for the Washington Student Achievement Council, but he has been an active member of the Graduate Tacoma Advocacy Network, as well as one of my favorite thought partners on the Policy Advisory Committee, which is a small group of partners who help guide our policy and advocacy work. So Gray, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us from a state agency's perspective, both what WASAC's role and responsibilities for the scholarship and other um, financial aid or post-secondary access work is, so folks on the call can understand kind of the purview of the agency. And also, you know, what did you all think about, you know, hearing from a community group about a, a needed policy change? 
Thanks, April. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as April mentioned, my name is Grace Thurling. I'm the Assistant Director of Policy and Planning at the Washington Student Achievement Council. And um, we are a state agency in the governor's executive cabinet um, that serves as a coordinating body among uh, education sectors in the state. Um, our work is centered on four key areas, affordability, enrollment, student supports, and completion. And part of that affordability scope uh, includes the administration of the Washington College Grant and uh, the College Bound Scholarship. Over the past couple of years, we've been really intentional about establishing uh, what I like to call feedback loops um, with communities in various regions. Uh, Tacoma is one of them uh, to, inform, um, to inform the work that we're doing, uh, both in policy and in the program administration side. Um, so given that frame, uh, when April approached me with what Liesl and others were thinking um, at TCSN, I was like, that's what I'm here for. Um, we are very much interested and uh, value highly uh, the voices in the community. Uh, we want to elevate those voices uh, to the powers that be, uh, whether it be at the legislative level um, in among our sector partners, OSPI, um, the, the public boards, uh, the governing body for CTCs, what have you, and any of those spaces where we can uh, leverage our voice and leverage our weight, um, we, we are wanting to do that on behalf of the community. So um, both April and I had collaborated in, in terms of what our best approach was uh, to kind of uh, get this uh, in front of the right audience. And um, so the PCSN put together a policy request uh, which was then forwarded to my office and ultimately championed uh, with the governor um, who ultimately turned it, uh, turned it into official policy through, um, through an executive order. Yes, and thank you so much, Greg, for your advocacy on behalf of um, TCSN and the work group. I don't know if everyone Everyone from TCSN here knows that it, it was this policy memo and this advocacy effort that ended up leading to the governor's proclamation. We actually weren't really aware of that till yesterday. So big kudos to all of you for being willing to raise your voices and ask for a what feels like a simple fix that would remove a barrier and allow for more equitable access to this scholarship and financial aid opportunity. So I just wanna ask both Lisa and Gray one last question. Well, actually Gray, really quickly, even though the governor has passed this proclamation, which now allows um, about a month of time where automatically every eligible student will be opted in without a signature, do we still need to pursue legislation this session that would make this a permanent fix? Yes. Um, so the, the nature of the governor's proclamation, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's whether it's because it's an emergency proclamation or if it's just uh, an executive order. I think it's because it's the emergency proclamation. It's only good for 30 days. Um, so that is the extent that he was able to, to put that into place um, that went in effect actually yesterday and goes through January 7th. Um, we at, uh, at WASAC are in the process and have already drafted up a bill uh, to make that change permanent. And we'll be forwarding that to the legislature and to the legislature as a formal request. Um, we also have that bill in front of the, the governor for him to more or less bless it uh, so we can move it forward. Um, but in any case, we are 100% behind this um, and, and making moves to make it a permanent change. Great. And just one question for you and Liesl before we move on. Would you, what advice would you give to other community partners who are really looking at a structural barrier impacting their work? Um, as far as like, how did you feel about approaching a policy shift? Um, yeah, anything you wanna add? Um, I can um, do it because it's not that hard. Um, we do have support in this um, collective impact model of other people with expertise around policy. And so as April talks about people uh, that are thought partners that understand policy, um, uh, Gray and Yokiko are great at that. April's great at helping us figure out how to frame it in a policy way. Um, and so you don't have to be an expert in political advocacy to um, get a little bit of support um, to understand how, um, how to frame it, how to make it um, understandable to people, what body of the, uh, that we need to advocate, advocate through. So there's plenty of support for this um, now in Graduate Tacoma, and I'm very appreciative of it. Thank you. Thank you, April. 
Gray, do you want to add anything before we move on? No, I just echo with what Lisa shared. Um, yeah, I I think oftentimes when when it comes to policy conversations, uh, people feel like it, it's inaccessible or that there's a, a huge uh, gap in in the ability to actually have those conversations. Um, but to, to Lisa's point, just just do it. Have a, <laughs> reach out to folks. Um, April is accessible. I'm accessible. Um, and then we can, if we can't figure it out, we'll figure out who can um, and then go from there. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. I want to introduce another amazing member. I have the best team I get to work with all the time with the Graduate Tacoma Advocacy Network, as well as the Policy Advisory Committee, David Westbrook from the University of Washington Tacoma, who's going to just give us a very brief political climate update. What are we working with this year? What does 2021 look like? And what can we all expect? Hi, David. Good morning. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And by that, I mean uh, spreadsheets and budgets and legislative proposals and revenue forecasts and, um, or maybe that's, maybe that's just me. Um, so just a, a little bit of, a little bit of nuts and bolts reminders for everybody. Uh, we're on a two year legislative cycle in Washington state. And this being an odd year, we are in the longer biennial budget year. So this is a 105 day session. So we are currently set for uh, about four months of, of joyous legislative engagement starting January 11th. And I, I believe uh, we're scheduled and hopeful uh, for signing die on April 25th this year, if I'm remembering my calendar correctly. Um, you may have heard uh, over this year as the legislature, like everyone else has had to respond to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and, and this year that seems like it won't end for any of us, right, uh, that they are struggling with uh, some of the revenue impacts of that. And earlier this year, that was looking very dire. You probably heard quite a bit of that in the news. They were looking at a $9 billion revenue shortfall, uh, could have been catastrophic. There was a lot of discussion you probably heard about coming in for a special session at one time or another. And there's a lot of threat to many of our programs and our friends in the community around things like social services and how to keep those things stable or prevent significant cuts. Um, as the year moved on, more revenue forecasts came in. Luckily, those cuts uh, did not happen as it happens. We don't see those dire impacts yet to our social services. So we went from $9 billion to uh, around September, we got a revenue forecast, cut that about in half. We were looking at $4.5 billion shortfall. And suddenly that didn't feel quite, quite as bad. And uh, last month we got a little bit uh, of an additional revision and um, I believe the current number uh, projected state revenue collection uh, will be down $2.4 billion through 2023. And somehow, somehow a $2.5 billion reduction now feels like, hey, that's not so bad to a lot of people going into session. But it is still a pretty daunting uh, picture for legislators to deal with as they go into session, they grapple with this biennial budget for the state. And so I'm sure they would all appreciate and we should all keep in mind that that is still um, that still is the budget environment as we engage for session. They have a, a pretty significant hole to deal with. There are $3 billion in state rainy day revenues, but I would expect there will be robust debate about to what degree and when and how to use those um, those funds as they grapple with that. Uh, so what does this session look like? Like uh, many other things, the legislature is gonna go virtual this year. So that's gonna be a different kind of engagement that we've all done in the past. Those big advocacy days where we all gather down in Olympia and uh, enjoy each other's company and make our cases and tell personal stories face to face. That's just not gonna be possible this year. But uh, we can hope that by going virtual, it actually makes um, access to our legislators more accessible for some folks in our community who can't make those trips to Olympia in normal years. So we're all gonna have to pivot. We're gonna think through how we uh, do this engagement through Zoom, how we do this virtually, how we don't do some of the same kind of in-person presentations that we did before. So, you know, for a lot of folks, you'll see that's video. That's gonna be Zoom. Um, that's gonna be a little more creative with our, with our access there as well. Also, uh, we've been hearing a lot from legislators about a focus on an equity lens for making legislative decisions, which is great to hear. I believe that there are commitments out of all four caucuses to be using an equity lens um, of, of some variety, uh, and we'll be looking at that as well. I would expect for those of you who've engaged in the past with legislative analysis and fiscal notes, we have even heard some talk about uh, the notion of equity notes as well as to impacts of legislation. So be prepared 
to think through uh, how these things will impact your organization, the computer and the community from an equity lens, make that case strongly to the legislature. I think you're, you're obviously gonna see them, they're gonna have to deal with COVID recovery. We do have this revenue shortfall. Um, how do we make that up? There's still a lot of uncertainty around what that budget forecast will look like in the coming months. It will continue to change. So, you know, we can't take that $2.4 billion number as gospel. They'll continue to get revisions there. Um, we also don't know what may or may not happen at the federal level. I know we've all watched that news and it ping pongs back and forth month to month as to are the negotiating, are they not negotiating just in the last two weeks? It seems like there's a different proposal every day. And then depending on what they pass there, whether or not there's state and local assistance that comes through and then impacts our state budget as well. So again, real uncertain environment for them there. I'll say in the two budgets uh, with the shortfall operating budget is tough. Uh, it's gonna be a real challenge to go to Olympia and ask for uh, new programs and new spending this year. Um, and we should all have that in mind as we make our legislative priorities. Uh, the other piece uh, there on the other side, the capital budget uh, in years past, there's some thought that the capital budget is a good opportunity for uh, economic stimulus. And in some of the previous downturns, you haven't seen the same kinds of impacts to the capital budget as the operating budget. So that's um, it's a quick run through of a, a lot of state budget stuff. I hope I got it mostly right and that our, our legislative champions on the call don't have to correct me too heavily there. Thank you, David. I appreciate um, the insight and um, you are our political guy all the time and I appreciate the support that our group gets constantly from you. So now I have the privilege of um, doing something scary, sharing my Zoom screen, <laughs> only because it's um, it never seems to go right. So hopefully it'll work and I get to unveil for all of you the 2021, the Graduate Tacoma 2021 Advocacy Priorities. So I will give that a go and um, just maybe ask um, if someone could speak up and say, because I can't see everyone, that, um, oh, sorry, nope, that you can all see this. If someone could unmute yourselves and tell me you can see this. Ah, we can see it. Thank you all so much. So Graduate Tacoma 2021 Advocacy Priorities. The Foundation for Tacoma Students is the 501c3 backbone organization that supports the Graduate Tacoma Community Movement, which is made up of over 350 community partners, all working collaboratively to improve the lives of our youth through collective impact. Over two years ago, the Graduate Tacoma Advocacy Network was formed. It is dedicated to elevating the Tacoma Pierce County voice to address impactful local, regional, and state policy issues that further our vision for a Tacoma where every child succeeds in school, career, and life. Oops, sorry, I went too far. This year, activated by a thoroughgoing commitment to equitable support for our most marginalized students and families, the Graduate Tacoma Advocacy Network will advocate for the following legislative priorities during the 2021 session. Lasting investments in quality early learning opportunities for more children. Stabilize K-12 budgets to protect school readiness. Implement an automatic opt-in for the college-bound scholarship. Safeguard funding for community-based organizations offering youth development programs. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of data and um, qualitative and quantitative data about each priority. But real quick before I do, um, the way that the Graduate Tacoma Advocacy Network came to these priorities is we ask all members to bring to the table throughout the summer and fall ideas and policy priorities that they've heard of, that their organizations are working on or the coalitions they are a part of are considering. We discuss at length what the impact of those priorities would be we re work with our data team to figure out what data is available that would show the needs in Tacoma Pierce County for these policies, the impact that could happen if we were to advocate successfully for them. And then we really narrow it down to ensure that we have an agenda that spans the cradle to career um, continuum. This year, we were very intentional that we identified priorities that were impertinent to this year, given the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic we really focused on priorities that were student-centered and that we felt were realistic given the climate that David laid out for us just now. 
Long-term sustainable financing of high quality community-based childcare and preschool opportunities will help ensure that success for Washington children throughout their educational career and beyond is not determined by their zip code, family income, race, or ethnicity. 50% of caregivers in Washington have difficulty finding childcare. 25% have left jobs or schools as a result of available or affordable childcare, costing the Washington economy $6.5 billion each year. In Pierce County alone, as of August, 20% of programs had closed and we had lost 25% of licensed childcare capacity due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are hopeful to get um, new numbers soon that we believe will show that these numbers have actually increased since the pandemic. Sustaining a supportive and learning ecosystem where students return to the classroom means keeping classroom funding whole to support and not punish teachers and administrators as they meet the current unprecedented instructional challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are asking that the state stabilize K-12 budgets to protect school readiness. As Lisa and Gray mentioned, we are going to very strongly raise our voice and ask for a permanent implementation of an automatic opt in for college bound scholarship removing oops, sorry guys, removing the necessary physical signature. Existing barriers in the application because of the signature and language barriers for ESL students and the complexities of college admission process for first generation students make that physical signature a barrier to completing for all college bound eligible students to sign up at the window of time, which is prior to high school. The state average sign up is only 72% of those eligible, meaning thousands of students neither apply nor end up being labeled a college bound scholar and can access the college bound scholarship once they enter post secondary. The Tacoma College Support Network and Middle School Work Group, as Lisa mentioned, has been working on this issue for many years. And although they get about 90% of the eligible students in Tacoma to sign up, they've never quite met that lofty 100% goal. And finally, we are gonna advocate that we safeguard funding and support for CBO's offering youth development program. Nationally, 88% of providers said that they are worried about the long-term sustainability and future of their programs in light of COVID-19. During the summer, just to give you a bit of context about Tacomas and how many students we serve in youth development programs, during the summer of 2019, there were over 9,000 youth development program slots utilized in Tacoma. Obviously that number changed in 2020, we don't have the most current one. And roughly a third of graduate Tacoma community-based youth development serving partners have said when recently surveyed that they are seeing an increase in demand for their services at this time, highlighting a great need for supporting this field. And finally, for the first time ever, we are going to have a 2021 support agenda, which includes the Tacoma Housing Authority Arlington Drive request, Amara's capital budget request, Help Me Grow Pierce County, and the Washington State Office of Equity. You will find more information about each of these support agenda items in the coming days on our website at www.graduatetacoma.org and in our advocacy newsletters that go out. But these are all issues that our network deemed very important to the holistic support of the holistic success of a student's life, but they felt that a partner was leading the charge on these and we would simply be lending our support how and um, if it is needed. Now I am going to just before we close it out, um, maybe see since we have a few of them on the meeting, see if any of our elected officials at any level want to just give us a little one minute pep talk on how to best engage with you all in this current COVID reality, whether you're a local elected official or a statewide one, what is the best way for our community to support um, to support you all. We don't want to be a burden to you. We know you're over Zoomed. We know that um, so much is being asked and you're going to have so much on your plates, but you know, what and how can we best engage with you and how can we best support you in the coming months as you make very, very, very important decisions that will, imp uh, that will impact the lives of all of us and our youth and families. I Go ahead. Senator Daniel, go ahead. <laughs> I can't tell who else is here, so uh, <laughs> I'll just jump in and say, uh, yes, it's going to be uh, terrifically challenging. David did a really good job of, 
of sort of giving you the lay of the land. Uh, we are gonna be working virtually, but that doesn't mean you should contact us at home. Uh, go ahead and continue to uh, send emails to our legislative offices. Our staff will still be at the ready if you wanna make uh, phone calls to them. I am particularly fond of one pagers, just a simple, short description. You know, you have to think about any kind of ask you're making to the legislature as if it is a grant request. So you all, I can tell, have written grant <laughs> grants uh, proposals before, uh, as have I. Uh, but think about it from the standpoint of naming what the problem is, uh, defining for us uh, a, a pathway to getting to whatever goal you want to seek. And so even if you've mixed up some things together, like when you've talked about Arlington Drive, Amara, Help Me Grow, Pierce County, Washington State Equity, Office of Equity, make sure that we have really succinct bullets on each of the requests that you have. Some of those are capital budget requests, I believe. Others are operating budget requests. Um, those are different for us, and we might put those in different file folders or different note uh, locations on our desktop. So be sure that you have short, succinct information and be sure to keep sending it to us. And tell us about your whole coalition too. I think that's really important for us to understand that this isn't just a request from one organization. This is, this is a body of people that are coming together saying this is what's important. Thank you so much, Senator Darnell. And, and this is Rep. Mari Levitt in the 28th, and I'll, I'll echo uh, what the senator said. She, she said it well. I think it's important that you reach out as if you always have been, um, but just in a, in a virtual way. We are still responsible to, to you know, engage, and, and um, we'll continue to do that and, and find different ways to do that. We're always available to schedule meetings by our legislative cell numbers as well, and, and you can work with our legislative assistant, and I think any coalition power um, that you bring is especially important um, to hear about. Um, and the other thing, if I could just do a quick FAFSA plug, um, because it's such a large group and you all have connections, there is no doubt that um, the FAFSA is a gateway um, and we, our numbers are incredibly low and we need everyone to engage and, and let our families and our youth know that the FAFSA timeline is now and it's and it's time to fill it out and, and get those in. And, and um, Rosie brought up a great point about undocumented students and the WASPA um, as well, but um, there, you know, that is that is a gateway pinnacle um, for many families and with House Bill 2158, you know, that's free college for those who are a family of four at 50,000 or less. And we just need to get the word out that college is accessible um, and the FAFSA is the beginning point and we need folks to fill it out. Thank you. Actually, uh, April, if I could add uh, another point, um, I noticed that uh, Senator-elect Nobles is not on the call today, but, uh, and it's hard to connect with people who are not yet in office, uh, but uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody understands that we have quite a few new people from Pierce County in legislative seats. And uh, I went ahead and emailed or texted Senator Nobles, Senator-elect Nobles uh, about the uh, the issue dealing with the College Bound Scholarship. She already has made a connection with Gray Sterling. Uh, so we can work uh, electronically. So don't, don't underestimate how quickly now we can get information to each other, but she's very engaged. And uh, just FYI, uh, she's been assigned both to the Early Learning and K-12 Education Committee where she is the vice chair and the Higher Education and Workforce Development Committee, which where she is the vice chair. So uh, be sure to take this time before the legislative session even to make a connection with Senator-elect Nobles. She is going to be uh, very open to your issues. And of course, she currently serves on the University Place School District. So she's, she's not new to these topic areas. So uh, make sure you can make a connection. Thank you, and thank you for the reminder that uh, we can use technology very quickly these days. Um, this is uh, this is Elizabeth Bonbright. I I just wanted um, I'm the Tacoma School Board 
member and vice, currently vice president of the Tacoma School Board. And I want to thank, uh, first of all, the um, senator and, and representative who, who've spoken and, and, and for being here and for being engaged. You always are and you always have been, and that's fabulous. And thank you for that. And I also want to thank everyone in this network because a Graduate Tacoma is, I mean, Tacoma in particular is is kind of the envy of a lot of communities because we have organizations like you, like Graduate Tacoma, which we're all part of and, and, and work together. And so I would say for, for local um, connections with local uh, elected officials, it's, it's critical that especially during session that you keep us in the loop on what's happening, what developments are so that we're um, understanding what the perspective on the street is um, and we can help with communicating with our colleagues um, in, in Olympia, even though they're not physically in Olympia, about um, how that impacts, for example, Tacoma Public Schools and, and what decisions are being made that they might not uh, completely understand. So thanks for all that you do as advocates. And also, um, we're a creative group. You know, We're talking about young kids and education. And uh, I think thinking of ways with using technology to, to make our case and to, and, and I would say to give voice to youth and, and engage um, student voices in how their, their lives are being impacted is going to be um, critical. So thanks for all of that. And um, you know, I, I know uh, also school board member, uh, director um, Lisa Keating is also on the call at the moment. So um, <clears throat> we're here to help and to um, let us know if we can be of any assistance. I don't know, Lisa, if you wanted to say something at this point. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, uh, so yeah, Elizabeth and I have been on a journey together, uh, new, new elected officials uh, at this almost at the same time in a pandemic has been quite the adventure. Um, I would just add to what um, Director Brombright said in that, um, well, so I am um, the legislative rep for the school board and by proxy the district. Um, which is a two year uh, term. So that's in, in addition to our um, other board um, responsibilities. And so um, I am the ledge rep for the state and federal level. So anytime that you have something um, that you feel um, we should know about or um, be connected to, please feel free to email, um, email me, email um, and you know, any of the board members so that we can stay informed. Um, I think that one of the biggest pieces for me that being someone that is um, uh, has come from community organizing and um, a grassroots effort, being in an isolated setting has been really challenging to stay connected and feel connected without being able to be in a space at the same time. So at any point, um, you know, I'm, I, I really genuinely want to hear from folks about what is um, going on, um, gaps, issues, um, celebrations, like maybe not just always negative things, like sometimes it's nice to hear positive things too, and things that are really working. So um, thank you to um, um, Graduate Tacoma and just the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you all for the um, last minute request to jump in and give us advice. I think I mentioned before, but our ultimate goal as a coalition and partnership is to support you all in the work you do to champion youth and families in Tacoma Pierce County. So if there's ever a way we can do that, lived experience, data, testimony, please feel free to reach out anytime. The, the power of our reach is pretty incredible when we actually go looking to see what we know. Um, I would also really quickly before we leave, really want to say thank you so much to my Graduate Tacoma Advocacy Network members and my Policy Advisory Committee. These individuals give us additional time every month from their individual roles and organizations that both span Tacoma Pierce County and the state. And they do so with a lot of uh, kindness. They always humor me with these incredible check-ins that we do, um, which have led us all to, I, I think maybe I'm speaking incorrectly, but bond and become friends, which has been a lifeline during this pandemic. They bring perspectives and insight about what is necessary to improve the lives of youth and families with an equity lens in Tacoma Pierce County. And from a selfish note, they make me better at my job every day. So thank you all so much for all the work you do. And um, with that, I will say, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us extra early. And I hope to see you all 
No, I'm gonna just say this. I hope to see you all in person in 2021.